I uh, hope everyone's doing well on this afternoon here. Oh, I need to go share my screen. There we go. Okay, there we go. So uh, a little bit about me first. I uh, just wanted to give everyone a little bit of an idea of where I'm coming from and how I ended up talking to you all here today. So I started as a software engineer for several years, but I kind of bounced around a lot of the IT space doing a lot of backend work and working with data. And that is how I ended up now. I'm a data engineer. And with that, uh, some of that coincided with my working at Excella, which started about three to four years ago as a consultant, which means I really do get to bounce around and work in a lot of disparate spaces. Uh, and so with that, I uh, kind of started hearing about data ops as a concept in about 2017 or so, uh, really with just this idea of hearing a lot of the practices I'm used to seeing as kind of a software developer and you know working with DevOps folks as I've watched that grow, really becoming a thing and applied to the data space, which I definitely had known had, you know, analytical data space moved a little bit differently. So with that, I was really excited about the idea. And last year, a little over a year ago, I was at a conference and ran into the data ops manifesto, which it's kind of convenient. I'm speaking right before Chris Berg, because uh, I'm pretty sure he's one of the people who helped author it. <laughs> um, and with that, it really hit home. I've definitely seen a few variations of kind of other ways where people have kind of just talked about data ops and encapsulated it, but this is the one that really hit home to me and covered all the things I'd heard about, all the things I was like, but what if we do this? And with that, I was kind of like, hey, this is awesome. And I kind of dug into a little bit and that's how I ended up here today with all talking to all of you. So uh, really is this idea of we have, it's a great way to have a conversation about data ops and kind of get everyone on board with this idea and really just kind of feel like my intention is one of us is way bigger than, or sorry, all of us is bigger than one of us. And with that, you know, let's all spread our ideas and kind of add to it and make data ops actually happen. So this is one of my favorite memes because it's essentially my career. Okay. So you're probably wondering why did anyone need feel the need for another manifesto? I mean, there's definitely, we've talked about there's a data, there's a DevOps manifesto that fell out of the Agile manifesto. There's, you know, it's one of these words that I think gets kind of watered down. So with that, I want to talk that you know, obviously, I'm guessing on this call, normally I would say if I had a room of people, I'd do a show of hands, but we're all virtual. Um, first off, I would say probably less of you, but I'm going to assume maybe one or two of you are at least coming out of more of the DevOps or kind of more traditional software development space. With that, I do want to say if any of you are here, thank you. You've all done a lot of really good work over the years to make sure that really what I used to have to do in the first five, six years of my career way back when, where we'd spend whole entire weekends deploying things. We'd have to spend a lot of late nights doing this stuff. Thank you for making that easier. Like it's so much easier now. We have CICD pipelines. We have all these things. We have, you know, all this stuff is just automated. It's great. I also want to say, how dare you make it harder now that I'm a data engineer and work with, you know, uh, machine learning specialists and data visualization people. Cause now the rest of the world expects us to now move at that same speed. Okay, I'm kidding, a little. Uh, with that though, I'm gonna assume most of you, if I were to ask to raise your hands, are probably a little bit more on like the data management side in various fashion. And I'm pretty sure all of you in that case recognize at least one or more of the things I have up on the slide where you've probably heard if not these exact phrases, you've, you've run into these scenarios. You kind of now, people are like, well in two weeks I can get an MVP of software that actually does something what do you mean my data warehouse is not gonna come that quick? What are you talking about? I can't just run reports against it. So obviously we've had to do some pivoting and kind of go with that. So that is why there's another manifesto. So when you're kind of probably wondering yourself like, okay, like, you know, maybe I get why data is different, maybe I don't, but let's just really talk about it. Like, why is it so different? Why are we in a space where some of these things still move in a little bit of a waterfall fashion? Maybe some things are fast, some things are not. We have divergent people, things like that. Why can software move at that speed and we're not? So let's assume you're already at the production phase or pretty close to getting to production. Sometimes these things don't scale. Sometimes you're doing a series of one-offs. You have to do a lot of, especially that nasty cycle of let's, get our data, let's analyze it, let's figure out what it is. 
okay, now let's move it forward. So let's talk about why that is. Probably the biggest hurdle to um, actually getting and scaling production and moving quickly and getting things out is the nature of data itself. You don't always control where your data comes from. I was actually chatting about this in the, the pre just kind of set up about where sometimes you're doing reshell shopping and everything says, hey, this is good to go. I can go get it at the store. And people at the store are like, we don't even carry that. The people who write the systems don't always have any say over what data goes into them or how that data like gets managed and it just, they have some access to it. Data can be messy. Sometimes the data is correct, but the structures are wildly divergent. On my day job, I'm working on a large identity management project. Let's talk about people's names, things like that. That's already divergent depending on what country you're in, what's considered. It's not always just the kind of standard first, middle, last name that we think of in you know, very specific subset of English speaking Western countries. Now expand that out to addresses, expand it to other things. The data itself can be wildly divergent in terms of structure. How it's stored also gets, you know, there's the classic, no, I'm just gonna shove the whole name in one column or I'm gonna have eight columns for name or any variation thereof of there's three columns and we kind of just miss and match where the middle names and some of the married names and things like that go. So already you're dealing with the fact that you just don't control these things whereas I feel like in traditional software, you generally are also working with the people who make the rules of say, here's these boxes, these boxes expect this. You have the UX folks making sure that they are in the right place and they're probably guiding you to the right information. You have front end folks making sure they put all the filtering, you have all these things. We don't always have that. If you're working with survey data and you help design the survey, great. Chances are you're not always working with that, especially in what I'm doing as a data engineer. So. That said, though, we still have to, we have to do a lot of validation on the data. We have to do a lot of those things just to make sure it's actually normalized in the fashion. We've all heard the stories of what happens when you have machine learning put up against uh, your data models being created, but then you don't have enough data or you have a very specific subset of data and you don't have like kind of the full picture, especially if you're dealing with like demographics, things like that. Um, we're all still dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. We've all seen a lot of, hey, this is exactly what's happening on this chart. And then find out, no, you only surveyed like 1% of the population and it's the wrong 1%, it's not across. So these things become very wild. So I think when you're working with all of this data it just makes it more complicated. Uh, those dashboards can look pretty, but they don't always have the right data. That's a huge issue. So that's the first off is you have to actually work with data and understand what you're looking at. I think the other side we've kind of run into is project management for data projects has evolved and been in a completely separate space than project management for software projects that has really embraced agile. I remember really people reading the extreme programming book and hearing about agile early, early in my career, early in the 2000s we've had some time to adjust to that. <laughs> so at the time though, our technology has changed dramatically. We've got cloud is coming up, this whole big data revolution that's brought us all here today. All of these things are expecting more data driven. The operations has gotten there and you have the ability to use it. We're not always managing it correctly. So obviously we're still a lot more in a little bit more of a waterfall kind of area, adjusting to agile, which is a whole other set of talks that other people I know are doing over and above the whole data ops space, but obviously we tie into that. Um, with that though, there's still a long way to go to get people to data-driven, self-service oriented, what they actually seem to want. So you've got technology catching up, project management a little bit behind, people trying to get those two working together. I feel like I've been in this space before, which is why data ops really resonated to me because it's about how I feel software that I worked in on the website was 10, 15 years ago, right when DevOps exploded and Agile was gaining ground. So that's where the data ops manifesto comes in. And obviously Chris Berg will probably talk a lot more about this because <laughs> he was there for some of this uh, and why, why it exists though, is these analytics projects are different than our traditional software cousins, but the problems we're running into are not hugely new. So now that we have a starting point, we can kind of say, okay, what is the same? What can we apply? What do we already know to borrow from Isaac Newton? You know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, so obviously a few companies kind of term, came up with the term data ops. It kind of started promoting it as that, you know, the, the hype cycle, even before the early adopters, they're the people who disrupted, obviously, 
you know, Data Manifesto came out through Chris Berg's company, Data Kitchen. Uh, again, I've said there's a couple others. This is one I like the most and what I'm running with. So with that, though, like I said, it's the best variation. And again, with the idea of agile and continuous improvement, you start on something and you continuously improve on that. So that is kind of where this talk came from, as it turns out. All right, I assume everyone's asking this, like, if you haven't seen it, what is in the manifesto? I keep talking it up. I keep talking about, hey, I have the starting point for talking about data ops. Let's find out. So if you're familiar at all with the, probably most folks I think have a little bit better idea of the Agile Manifesto, it starts with three lines. That's it. And they look very similar to the first three lines you have here. The main difference is we're talking about analytics overall, as in data management working with code versus just software. Uh, the DevOps variation of this is working with infrastructure, if I remember correctly. But essentially the idea is people are important, the tools don't go away, but the people you're working with are important. The producing the working thing is important. Obviously we should document it, it doesn't go away, we just want something to work first collaborating and making sure we work across a teamwork. So those three should sound really familiar. No reason to fix it, it's not broken. The other two were added to kind of talk about these really unique challenges we deal with as data practitioners. So with that, um, we generally, you know, basically need to worry about, we still do need to do some upfront work. So let's do that upfront work. And with that, oop, sorry about that. Uh, we have to, um, you know, decide, hey, we still need to start somewhere. We need to understand the data to some extent, but what point is that good is the enemy of great or great is the enemy of good? Where do we decide good is? Where do we start, jump off of what in Agile, you know, kind of the sprint zero, as it were? Experiment, work with it, roll it over, keep churning out something better and better, at least get something in front of customers before you do this like six months to a year and say the data warehouse has given me wrong results and this dashboard doesn't make sense, things like that. And the idea is also that, that going back to that customer collaboration and interactions, cross-functional ownership, the idea being you need to actually understand data across all sources. This is one of those things that's, I love it. I love a challenge. This has been a huge challenge since I've gone more into the data management space entirely and become a data engineer is, Right now I have to work across nine or 10 different identity or case management systems at the um, client that I have. Some of them are purely people. Some of them are how people are worked through the system. We have to combine all of those and really understand, I have eight John Smiths that are coming in. Five of them are actually, we think the same John Smith. And two of them might be related to one of the John Smiths that are the other people, but maybe not. We have to kick that off to a manual system. The manual system gives us some input. Eventually we will go back in and say, hey, now that we have more input, let's run some more machine learning against it. All these things play together. Sometimes you find out those five John Smiths are not really the same John Smith. One of them is John Smith Jr. Okay, we kick him out, things like this. It's a huge problem we're trying to solve. We're iterating over an existing solution of it that sort of works for a very limited case, but is also a nightly batch. We're trying to get it to, no, let's run this thing as streaming. We have all these engineering challenges, but we also have a lot of data challenges. So we need to work across those nine systems, which is soon becoming 11 systems as other source systems kind of roll on. So you got to work across your organization. So with that though, there are 18 principles that the authors of this came up with that really kind of go a little bit deeper dive into it. I'm going to let folks just kind of read that. There's some extra text on it. There's a link to the data manifesto itself in uh, the back of my slides that'll get shared out. So feel free to check that there and I'll probably share a link in the chat as well. Uh, but with that though, you know, here's the high level ones. I'm going to kind of group them together because to me, they really kind of fit a theme. So the first three are definitely, if you've worked in any kind of modern software development or DevOps culture environment, you should recognize these, but also recognize they are very much a balancing act when you're in the data world. You Embracing change is definitely something that may be a little harder for some of us that have been doing this, for some folks that have been doing this a while, even for me sometimes, because a lot of my data is definitely very different than my software experience you still need to recognize this stuff's coming in all the time. People do things upstream that you don't control. We have to work with it a lot faster than we ever did now. 
So we need to embrace it. As customers see new insights, though, we've got to go back the other way around and kind of work with that. I, to quote a colleague of mine, if you're doing data analysis projects correctly, whenever you get an answer, what you're doing should change the question that you're asking. And you go back and ask and you rinse and repeat. And if you think about it that way, suddenly getting things out to the customer, doing that more agile idea, getting something so they can say, oh, wait, now we want to know this, you get closer and closer to what some version of the truth is. So data ops really looks to this idea of can we make that process robust and repeatable and really get whatever question we're trying to ask now answered so that we can find out what the real question we should be asking is, so on and so on. Now, the next few are a little bit more team related and really just generally a little bit easier to enact because I think a lot of us are a little bit more used to these things or they're a little bit less of a lift on the organization. Uh, and, you know, as long as you've worked in a team and you're trying, you know, don't, don't go down the cowboy route, uh, which I still see occasionally, but I advise against it. And that's why the one I really want to call out is the reduce heroism. By far, that has been any time I've been on a data project and even some of my more kind of old school software projects has been probably one of my biggest drawbacks is it's so easy to be, well, I'm the guy who just knows this. Let me just get this enacted, get this out of here, get it done. I just, I don't care if it's the 11th hour, it just needs to happen. It's too late to bring someone in or we have a deadline, we have a deadline. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> We've been pushing back on it on traditional software and DevOps exists for that reason. Data ops takes that on as a huge burden for a very good reason of do not do that. Please stop doing that. I know pipelines fail in the middle of the night, a 3 a.m. call because something is blowing up and it's a nightly job that's going to handle all the finances for the next month, sometimes the year-end job. We have all been there. It's all one of our biggest nightmares. Uh, especially if it's when some upstream source changes at the last minute and the entire thing just, you know, shifts a schema that you didn't expect, things like that. Especially if it was one of their last minute bug fixes, but theirs is going through a cycle where they're deploying 30 times a day and it's totally fine. And they've got all these automated tests and things like that. We become the bottleneck. It's a problem. So the data ops mindset is kind of the same way of DevOps being a culture. I think of data ops is kind of a culture as well is really focus on let's work across it, let's get the team involved, let's get the organization involved, let's go cross everything that we need to do and split this stuff up, break it down, work with it. And to that, if you're familiar at all with kind of that DevOps culture that I mentioned, this is where those ideas really come into play, both the culture and the technology. Take advantage of the environments you have. Most of us are doing, to some extent, some sort of cloud. I know there's already been some other data summit talks about hybrid cloud to even go the next step. Um, now, imagine, think back, like what modern data science looks like, especially. I get that some of those algorithms are from the 70s. Some of them are 300 years old. But imagine like the computing hardware from easily even 20 years ago, let alone 30 to 40 years ago, and the scale of data that we have now. If you didn't run out of processor, you were gonna run out of storage. It was painfully expensive. Both those things are much more in spades now. You have modern environments. You don't need to provision servers anymore. You don't need to order them and set them up. You just run some scripts on Chef for Cloud, you know, uh, cloud Bees, any of these things, Jenkins, all of them just set it up, move it on, Terraform. It creates it. You can create in test environments. You can do all these things. You can really do these things. You can scale up or horizontally. You can scale up vertically, scale across horizontally. You can create bigger databases, you can, whatever you need to do. So let's do it. The main thing though is everything within data ops should be treated as code. If it's an artifact of your project, it's code. I don't care if it's a data visualization dashboard or maybe some arguably code, but I mean, it's code if you're writing R or Python or somebody do some native analysis, but it's not intended to be run all the time. Still treat it as code. Data models, often, you know, they're big graphics. They're gonna be stored at best as XML. They're still code. Treat them as code. Do everything you would normally do with code. If it's, you know, version it, do whatever you need to do. Treat it as production worthy code to the extent that you can. Infrastructure as code is a DevOps thing. For us, analytics is code. So the very last one, remember when I said that if you are doing correct analysis, your insights will lead to new questions? You're probably now asking, what is all this manufacturing stuff? That's a good question. 
And that is where the folks who wrote the Data Ops Manifesto had a really good inspiration. They said, DevOps came a little bit out of Lean and a lot out of Agile. Agile came a lot out of Lean manufacturing and this Kaizen idea of break things down smaller, rebuild them appropriately. They went back and said, let's look at Lean manufacturing again. What can we glean from this? And the idea is, in the lean manufacturing process, you grab data, you grab essentially metadata for us on your actual process. And you say, hey, I have all this data. It's a good thing I work in data management. I know exactly what to do with this. You take the data, you look at your pipelines, you look at who's looking at your dashboards, like, you know, have they enacted things on it? You've looked at how accurate are your machine learning models or, you know, what's your gauge of accuracy and change that up over time. And you really enact and go, let's apply our data back to the source of what we're actually doing. So with that, um, you take samples and you just kind of say, hey, let's look at these samples. Let's, you know, you can at best do cool things like self-healing data pipelines, things like this to just spit back up. You can use existing DevOps tools, make sure your systems are going, things like that. But you can also go back to the customer and say, hey, we're decreasing the number of failures we have, the number of bad data. Are we finding more bad data? Can we go back and find out what's going on? Uh, things that can't be handled by our, you know, our nightly ETL pipelines or our general streaming data, stuff we can't process. Quality is on here twice for a reason. You want to make sure you are always giving quality being A, what the customer wants most, B, in general, for some version of accuracy, is, is it accurate? Here's the one that's not in here, but I always like to suggest it. Keep a human in the loop. We do things automatically. Obviously, this comes up a lot with uh, any kind of machine learning or any other thing falling under the AI spectrum of, hey, still get people looking at it. Look at it every step of the process. Um, as a note, I gave this talk in a meetup last year had this image i loved the um idea i threw the image of course you know if if something tells you that that's a person at a computer based on training data you screwed up really bad <laughs> so with that though i said hey i got this quote i was at a panel on ethics and ai i can't remember who said it but i loved it the speaker coming immediately after me who was sitting in the front row looked up and said wait that's my quote so I've iterated on my own slide deck and gave him you know, a very brilliant data scientist who I'm now uh, an acquaintance with credit for that quote. So in the last few minutes, you're kind of wondering, how do I do data ops? Like what, how do I enact this stuff? Good question. So some of these, let's just kind of go through ideas here. I'm going to group them for you. There are general programming practices on this slide. I think hopefully for any of us who are definitely more on the interaction, like interacting things side, they shouldn't be a huge surprise. But I just want to repeat, sometimes they can be different on the data management space. Test-driven development, as it comes out of traditional software, doesn't always work in the specific textbook way that I think a lot of folks expect it to. Sometimes you don't really, like you know the answers in a data project, you're trying to come up with the questions, not always the other way around. Now with like nightly pipelines, and if you have a good idea of like data coming in fits these parameters, it's always gonna fit these parameters coming out. Certain things are always going to be discrete rules. Of course, TDD will work in that sense. There's definitely some things that are a little harder to gauge or more subjective. So yes, it works. When it works, please use it. Or please make sure you are testing as much as possible. You may have to change what your tests are sometimes. If it can be a discrete test, please use it. If it needs to be a subjective kind of arranged test of, hey, I know that this is a thing that is positive and the upper limit's about a million, put some tests in that kind of at least check for if it's out of range, but you might need to have a maybe this is okay and flag it as opposed to shut things down, you have a problem. Regardless, automate all of that as best you can. Um, version control and branching are also huge ones. A little hard to do sometimes version control on your Python or Scala code to write a pipeline. It's code, we have tools for that, it's pretty easy. Uh, versioning your dashboard, versioning your physical model that you created in like Erwin or something, eh, a little harder. Uh, there are tools, more and more of them coming out for that kind of thing, but still kind of a new space. Uh, if you have old school 
traditional kind of ETL projects. And I know they're getting a little bit better for some of the tools. I've seen some great stuff that saves code for you. A lot of them though have proprietary formats or they're again like XML or something that's text readable, but really a pain in the butt to try to work with like any inversion control tool, but we're getting there. Um, otherwise, same thing with branching and merging. The merging becomes very hard, but in general, version those things. There's even data versioning now. If you're saying I ran machine learning on X, Y, and Z training data and it produced X, Y, and Z results, you can still version those things at best store just cheap. You can store it in some sort of S3 bucket or equivalent on other clouds. Or, you know, again, there's actually tools even coming out for data versioning, which is pretty awesome. Again, if you're familiar with a little bit more of the DevOpsy side of things, and this should not hugely look different because it's better back to infrastructure as code and that general idea that's been around for a while. Uh, at least 10 years by my count of it being popular, probably known before that. I was a little behind the time, so I was working at a large defense contractor 10 years ago. Uh, very good at security, about five years behind on everything else at the time. Um, but in general, a lot of these things are super important when applied to the data ops, to data space and kind of really help with that data ops. Remember that development times used to be slower. A lot of things were physical hardware constraints. We were on premises. We had a lot of bottlenecks. I mentioned that you have to run the big finance job at the end of the month kind of thing. Well, in compute time, you can scale up if you need to. You can run that ugly job for four to five hours and scale it back down or just kill your EMR instance or whatever else you're using if you don't need it. You don't have to have what, you know, back in the old days we called the supercomputer floating around and it gets used for that only and occasionally some parallel processing. There's stuff out of the box that does that now. Use it, enjoy it. Um, storage is dirt cheap now and super fast. So you really just work on that. You know, you branch your environments out. You say, I need to have a test environment for load testing. Spin that up, test it up, see what it looks like. If you don't think you're ever going to get that load or not for another you know, year or two, just want to know things are scalable in case you get a COVID-19 situation where you're getting a lot of online shopping or you're, suddenly your telecommunications infrastructure is shot because people are spread out all over. You can test it. You can know that it's there and start leaning into that systems reliability engineering and say we're good and you know knock it back down. You can run what if scenarios on some really complicated data science scenarios and run it out and you're great. Containers, these are amazing. I wish these existed even 10 years ago, <laughs> maybe even five years ago where you know, we're more of in vogue than they were. Containers are awesome. You can even now fake your database environment. You can fake cloud services. You can do a lot of these things in containers and you can spin them up on a laptop and test out some ideas, create tools, things like that deploy it out to the cloud as is. The number of times I've had pipelines fail at three in the morning, again, the nightmare scenario, because something changed in my code or there's one little infrastructure and thing that we missed in a deployment because the server moved and changed off my one number and the IP address, things like that. Not to worry about that anymore. Okay, the IP address thing maybe, but in general, upgrades to the OSs, things like that. You have containers, you test this stuff out, it's good. Um, even if you are working with some on-prem stuff mixed with your cloud, you have containers. It's still reasonable to manage those things. If you can have something that looks like your server, it's really just Docker and test that thing out and kind of move it forward. And the last one uh, that is one of my favorites, and I really have just called it fake it till you make it. The idea being, Sometimes we just don't have access to things. I'm literally running at this right in my day job where I know that we're going to have to enable some streaming out of something that's a batch job. I know what the database looks like. I can actually look at the production data. I cannot get in there and apply any tools to extract that data right in this minute, land it where I need it to land it, work with it. Can't do it. There's a lot of it waiting on paperwork to happen, you know, signatures to dry. Sometimes in the physical sense, I am working at a government client. Uh, sometimes just these things take a while. We know they take a while. Sometimes you have DBAs who are like, hey, I'm the one person covering three totally separate systems. You have these things. Fake it till you make it. Come up with your schema. You can, we wrote a tool that does code generation. Or is it basically, it comes up with this mock data and you can scale the mock data to for load testing. You can 
add these different things in to give different scenarios for how much errors do you want? Do you want good looking data? Do you want it to enact this other system versus it's only this case management or you know, different scenarios? We're working on things like that. We're working on, we know what this looks like, but it's only in our piece of the cloud. We don't have access to their other piece yet, but again, we can use containers. We can use these other things to pack it up move it over and otherwise deploy infrastructure as code and just use Terraform or CloudFormation or something and just kind of plop it over when we have the ability to. And then all we have to work out is the last little bit of networking, but you can start creating dashboards against that. You can send your people who actually have to do data science and really analyze real data. We still have access to that and we can get it on a one-time basis. They can still go do their analysis. They can still do things like that while we're actually developing the engineering side separating the data itself and the analyzing the data from the engineering piece of processing the data has saved us a ton of time and gets things done in parallel. So the last one, I wanna say it before and I'll say it again, borrowing directly from the authors because this is still my favorite part of the entire manifesto, don't be a hero. Focus on the principles of the data ops manifesto, start working towards a culture where you have highly performant data teams, using principles that are coming out of Agile, coming out of DevOps, coming out of lean manufacturing. They all came before, they're well proven. We have ways to do it. So what you're probably wondering though is, okay, like data ops sounds awesome. When can I start? Like, guess what? You're probably already doing some of it. You're probably already enacting some of these good engineering practices, I hope. If not, I work for a consulting company. We'd be happy to talk to you. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, if you're at this talk, you're clearly interested in data ops. So obviously there's a lot more out there. Some of this is for us probably project. If that's not enough, I have a few links in my slides, uh, a couple of which even talk to. Uh, send you right over to the company my uh, Chris Berg, who's following me, works for. So, uh, And a couple of other sources I had for coming up with this talk. So. Hopefully uh, everyone likes it. If you have questions, I will be on till the end. And of course, just submit them in the chat. Thank you very much, Eric.